This problem talks about a flow of traffic where there is a jam. So the figure here shows a cluster of slow-moving cars close together where the jam is, and then we can see further on the left are the faster-moving cars that are approaching the jam. And then presumably further on the right, there would be a point where, when the jam ends, the cars further to that side are going to be speeding up again. This problem is interesting in that it's kind of asking us to analyze this cluster of the slow-moving cars close together to treat them like a pulse or, or a shock wave flowing through the traffic like a fluid. And it even talks about how this cluster can move along the traffic, either downstream or, uh, downstream or upstream along the traffic. And that makes sense to think about, because if we think about it, if cars are going to be approaching the shockwave from the left at a faster rate than cars are leaving the shockwave, then we can imagine that this pulse is going to be moving against the traffic, or upstream, as defined in the problem statement. But if cars are entering the pulse more slowly, then we can imagine that this cluster of cars will, for the most part, continue moving to the right, and the shockwave will continue traveling downstream. Part A of the problem asks us to find the separation distance necessary between the faster cars in order for the pulse to remain stationary, not moving downstream with the traffic and not moving upstream against the traffic. So let's think about what, that, what it must mean for that to happen. If the pulse of these cars is not moving, then that must mean that every time one car is added to the mix, it is completely taking the place of whatever, whatever car was already at the back end of that cluster. Or, more specifically, looking at this diagram, by the time this red car joins the pulse and has to slow down, it must be exactly where this green car is. In other words, the time it takes for this red car to take the place of the green car must be the exact amount of time it takes for the green car to completely take the place of the yellow car. The slow-moving cars within the shockwave must be taking the place of the next car at the same rate at which the fast-moving cars outside the shockwave are taking the place of the car in front of them. So turning this into an equation, recall that the formula for speed is equal to distance over time, and we're talking about time. We're looking for something that has equal times. So we're going to algebraically rewrite this to solve for time, and you'll find that by multiplying both sides of the equation by t and dividing both sides of the equation by v, we recall that t, time, for the time for a motion at a constant speed is equal to the distance traveled divided by that speed. So for our problem, in order for the red car to take the place of the green car, it must travel a distance of d plus l. So d plus l divided by the speed of v. That's the speed for the fast-moving cars. And remember, this time must be equal to the amount of time it takes for the green car to completely take the place of the yellow car. So, for the green car to take the place of the yellow car, it has to travel a distance of L over the slower speed V sub S. Now, fortunately for us, aside from the variable D, which is what we are looking for, Every other variable here is given to us in the problem, so all we need to do is algebraically solve for d. First, let's multiply both sides of the equation by v to get it out of the denominator. Then, we'll subtract both sides of the equation by l to get d on its own. So our final equation for d is lv divided by v sub s, all minus l. Now we'll just plug into this equation the values that are given to us in the problem. So we have d equals l, or 12 meters, multiplied by v, or 25 meters per second, divided by v sub s, or 5 meters per second, all minus the l of 12 meters. Put this into a calculator, and we find a length of 48 meters. 
So in order for the shock wave of cars to remain stationary, then the distance between the fast moving cars must be 48 meters. But now part B of the problem asks us to double our answer to part A. So our new value for D is equal to two times 48 meters, which is 96 meters. Now with this larger distance in mind, we can assume that the shock wave won't be stationary anymore. It'll be moving. So parts B and C of the problem ask us to find both the speed of the shock wave and its direction. For this part of the problem, we're going to use a version of the equation we use for part A, but we're going to do it in a much more general way. In part A, we said that the time it takes for a slow moving car to overtake the car in front of it is going to be the same amount of time it takes for a fast moving car to overtake the car in front of it. And in order to keep the shock wave stationary, the distances that the cars had to move during that period of time had to be related to the length of the car plus its buffer zone, hence why we use the variable L. But now, since we're no longer assuming that the shockwave will be stationary, we need to use a more general version of this variable. Now it's going to be some, some unknown variable that represents how far each of the car moves during that time. It's no longer, we can't assume it's just going to be L now. So instead, let's, divide, let's define a new variable called X. So after some period of time T, the slow-moving cars will have traveled a distance of x, and the faster-moving cars will have traveled a distance of d plus x. Now since x is the only variable in this equation that is not known, the first thing we'll do is solve for x. So first off, again, let's multiply both sides of the equation by the denominators to get rid of those. So v sub s multiplied by d plus x is equal to v times x. And just to make this a little easier on us, I'm just going to plug some numbers in right now. So v sub s is the slow speed, which is 5 meters per second. d is our distance of 96 meters, plus x, that's still unknown, equals v, our big speed, which is 25 meters per second, times x, which is unknown. I'm now going to distribute the 5 on the left-hand side of the equation. So 5 times 96 is 480 plus 5x equals 25x. Then let's subtract 5x from both sides of the equation to get the x's together. So 480 equals 25x minus 5x, which is just 20x. And then to solve for x, we divide both sides of the equation by 20 to find that x is equal to 24 meters. So now we can find the amount of time this is taken by plugging in x into our time equation because this will help us determine the speed of those slow moving cars which in turn will help us determine the speed of the shock wave. So for t equals x divided by v sub s we have 24 meters divided by the slow speed of 5 meters per second which gives us a time of 4.8 seconds. So this means that for those slow-moving cars within the shockwave, those slow-moving cars travel a distance of 24 meters every 4.8 seconds. However, one thing that is important to realize is that the speed at which those slow cars are moving is not the same as the speed of the pulse itself. Because don't forget that every time this time interval passes, another car is being added to the left side, to the beginning of the pulse, which is setting back the position of the pulse by a distance equal to the length of the car. So looking at the diagram for a second, the pulse may be in the process of moving to the right, but the next time a car is added to the left side, it sets the position of the wave back by a distance equal to L, the length of the car. So if we're going to find the speed of the shock wave, then the change in position with respect to time for the shock wave itself isn't, like the, the change in position isn't just 24 meters, 
but it's 24 meters minus L, minus the length of the car. Minus 12 meters, because that is how much the position of the shockwave is being set back by the addition of the next car after each interval of T. And the time interval is just 4.8 seconds. And if we put this into a calculator, then we find a speed for the shockwave of 2.50 meters per second. And so that is the speed of the pulse of cars. Finally, part C of the problem asks for the direction of the pulse's motion. Is it downstream with the flow of the traffic, or upstream against the flow of the traffic? And we can kind of figure this out by compar comparing the value we found for x to the value that was given for L. Remember, this x value represents how far the car has moved after a certain time interval. After each time interval when a new car is added to the pulse. In part A, this value had to be equal to L in order for the pulse to be stationary. But since our x value for part B is larger, that means that after every time interval, after every time a new car is added to the pulse, the slow moving cars have made it further, which means, which tells us that the pulse is moving further downstream. It is moving further to the right, further forward in traffic, because x is larger than L. And this makes intuitive sense as well, because the change that was made in part B is that the faster moving cars entering the pulse are now farther apart. And if those cars are farther apart, that means intuitively that tells us that cars are entering the pulse at a slower rate. And if cars are entering the pulse at a slower rate, then that means that the slower cars have more time to make it further before they're set back again by the addition of a new car to the group. So the answer to part C is that because x is larger than L, the distance, the direction of the shock wave is downstream. And that is it for this problem. I hope this video helped you out. If it did, please consider subscribing, as that'll help me out in making more videos just like this. And if you have a request or a question, leave a comment down below, and I'll do my best to help you out as best I can. That's all for now, and I hope you all have a lovely day. Bye-bye.